morning, I have a particular pleasure to introduce Dan Schiller, whom I have known for an embarrassingly long time. I think the, the first time I spoke to Dan, he was an undergraduate at the University of Wisconsin, deciding on where to go to graduate school. Uh, he did the right thing, and here we are decades later. Um, and Dan, as I hope you all know, has really done important work uh, in communication, communication history, in how to think about information, in informatics, I think a term I first heard from uh, from Dan, uh, and in the history of news, the part I'm particularly uh, invested in, and I was working with together quite a long time ago. So it's really a distinct pleasure to uh, bring him here. Uh, no PowerPoint, just, uh, just Dan, who will speak about Power Under Pressure, Digital Capitalism and the Financial Economic Crisis. Thanks, Larry. It's a real pleasure to be here, and uh, I'm going to treasure it. So uh, I'm going to launch right in. I am afraid I'm going to ask for you to uh, tax your energies for a little while, because I'm not going to use anything other than my voice. Uh, and. Uh, I'm told to announce that this is all under copyright. <laughs> so please take that seriously. Uh, what is being taped for you to do? Yeah, well, I know, but that's why I'm oh, saying it. I and see. I'm going to be repeating that every 15 seconds <laughs> <laughs> as time goes on. Uh, quote, the past year has been one of the great accomplishments in the economic field, wrote the Secretary of Commerce four years into the slump. We find almost every major indicator of business conditions moderately above the level of a year ago. There's much evidence that the recovery will proceed progressively, that our remaining problems will be slowly but surely surmounted. That calming message came on New Year's Day, 1934. <laughs> what we now call the Great Depression still had years left to run. Today, the predicate of booming corporate profits has been millions of layoffs, with no end in sight for high unemployment. Housing prices continue to stagger, commercial real estate is stressed. Consumer demand remains iffy, with record-setting inequality adding to the burden. Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke noted in November 2010 that the level of output in the advanced economies overall was about 8% below its long-term trend. European sovereign debt crises, rocketing grain prices, and the outbreak of what the Brazilian finance minister called a currency war engender other reverberating instabilities. Dominique Strauss-Kahn, the director of the International Monetary Fund, allows that, quote, it is a recovery beset by tensions and strains which could even sow the seeds of the next crisis. Financial Times journalist Martin Wolf has been more forthright. This crisis is far from over, he wrote six months ago. How long the crisis may last is an open question. The concept of digital capitalism offers a way of clarifying the important role of communications in this global slump. I developed this concept at a sharply different moment during the late 1990s as a corrective to the triumphalism that circulated around the so-called new economy. Capital, I argued, remained at the center of the political economy, even as the market system was restructured to accept a more information-intensive orientation. This remains true today. But circumstances have altered decisively. Today, for the first time in 75 years, the world is mired in a downturn which originated in the developed market economies. The slump's epicenter is the historical hub of ICT innovation. The theory of digital capitalism now must ask, how is the political economy's escalating reliance on communications linked to today's crisis? And moving from there, how may communications and information figure in its eventual resolution as the global market system reorganizes? Our starting point is the 1970s. 
responding to what was then the most severe downturn of the post-war era, U.S. elites sought to restore profitable market growth by developing what David Harvey calls a spatial temporal fix. Within the many-sided and contingent processes of reconstruction that followed, information and communications played central roles. <coughs> I'm going to sketch uh, a few of these. Consider first the 40-year flood of capital into finance. The roots of this financialization encompass more than bankers' avarice. The crumbling of the post-war international financial order supplied the critical context. Judith Stein explains how transnational companies doing business in multiple national markets and currencies sought new means of hedging risks arising from newly volatile exchange rates as we went off the gold standard. That's usually the kiss of death. I start talking the gold standard and it plays <laughs> over and that's it. But uh, I'll just keep trying and you'll, you'll uh, do what you can. Um, meanwhile, overcapacity and growing competition in manufacturing industry placed pressure on corporate accumulation strategies, motivating a flight into financial vehicles. Stagnating wages concurrently stimulated household demand for credit and a willingness to take on debt. Finance became a site of massive ICT investment to support both network services and mathematically complex product innovations. From the late 1960s remake of Wall Street around computerized trading, and Citibank CEO's Walter Riston's 1970s encomiums to the information standard. You may recall some of you the information standard. We went off the gold standard. We went on the information standard. We may trace an unbroken line from these statements to the present. Financial services companies constitute the second largest sectoral source of demand for ICTs following the communications industry. And big banks may well spend more on technology than tech companies. In 2008, Citigroup employed 25,000 software developers and spent an estimated $4.9 billion on ICTs. And today's J.P. Morgan Chase, it's double that. So, I mean, it's, it's a huge investment. With the deregulation and increasing interlinkage of global finance, the new tools and products allowed risk to be repackaged and spread across the world. This dispersal of individual risk turned out, however, to spread systemic risk. When the crisis erupted in an obscure corner of the US market for mortgage-backed securities, networks conveyed its death ray pulse outward instantaneously. <coughs> A second crucial means of restoring profitable growth stemmed from the federal government, and in particular from the Department of Defense. Coming out of World War II, corporate capital had allied with military agencies to launch what became a sustained technological revolution in information processing and communications. Project SAGE and the distant early warning line were formative examples. A decade or so later, uh, the Vietnam War bequeathed new visions around the so-called electronic battlefield. Visions of net-centric warfare have grown successively more grandiose. Uh, consider Reagan's Star Wars, Strategic Defense Initiative, which catapulted weapons spending into the internet era. ICTs have become intrinsic in the machinery of war. Here's the Deputy Secretary of Defense writing in a recent issue of Foreign Affairs that some of you may have seen, and I'm quoting. Information technology enables almost everything the US military does. Logistical support, global command and control, real-time provision of intelligence, remote operations. Every one of these functions depends heavily on the military's global communications backbone, which consists of 15,000 networks and seven million computing devices across hundreds of installations in dozens of countries. More than 90,000 people work full-time to maintain it. So again, a sense of the labor that's directly involved. 
In one estimate, uh, DOD's 2011 IT budget exceeds $36 billion, approaching half of the federal government's overall spending on IT. The contradiction between this lethal high-tech apparatus and humanity's need for peaceable reconstruction remains, of course, acute. The third and fourth vectors of ICT growth ran together. As in the wake of the 70s profit squeeze, capital broadly reorganized the production system. One centered around cutting labor costs. Crucial here was the innovation of lean production practices, which some of you will remember as a buzzword, uh, in which IT heavy and employee light systems were introduced in an expanded series of work settings. Real wages in the United States dropped by 10% between 1978 and 1983. And beginning in 1979, the value of US labor power fell for the remainder of the century. Contributing to the decline were concurrent attacks on unions, uh, reduced government support for social services, downsizing, outsourcing, and rapidly growing foreign direct investment. Attempts to reduce labor costs succeeded beyond the imagination of corporate leaders during the Nixon era. The flooding of the global market for labor power with a couple of billion people through China, the old Soviet bloc, and other parts of what was once a more independent third world marks are arguably the outstanding feature of our times. Harvey underlines the profoundly contradictory result that its success in pursuing what he calls wage repression means that capital must now contend with flagging consumer demand. Like financialization, however, newly accelerated foreign direct investment came about not only because of capital's power, but also because of its vulnerability. Renewed intercapitalist competition and deepening excess capacity drove business to seek out new investment outlets for the surplus that was the crushing result of its own prior success. Big companies had long been purchasing factories, offices, mines, plantations outside the US domestic market. The motivations varied case by case. Cheap labor power, enhanced market access, new sources of natural resources. The near instant doubling of the world's wage labor supply, though, gave strong new priority to corporate efforts to reorganize their production systems. TNCs began to set up integrated cross-border supply chains to sell into multiple national markets, including the United States. As recently as 30 years ago, writes the Director General of the World Trade Organization uh, just a month ago, products were assembled in one country using inputs from that same country. No longer. Today, the concept of country of origin is obsolete. No car or commercial jet, or we might add cell phone, could now be built with inputs from just one country. This internationalization of production hinged on ICT. Corporate information systems were repeatedly re-engineered in light of shifts in strategy, public policy, networking technology. Corporate or enterprise networks account for the lion's share of all network-related spending. This is worth remembering because we tend in communications to think it's all the consumer market. Consumer market, it's very hard to get good data, but it might be 30% of the overall spend. A trade association, uh, well, actually, that was the next sentence. I, I guess I don't need to say that anymore. Uh, you get trapped. You know, it's just the way that webs of discourse. Uh, offering a springboard into new territories of profit as Gary Fields has called it, what I call accelerated commodification propelled, propelled a series of changes in and around communications. One of these was a spectacular buildup of investment to modernize newly liberalized network infrastructures. Liberalization began in the giant US market, but quickly moved beyond. What had been mostly a government operated service was reorganized into a corporate commercial function. Between 1988, when Chile privatized its incumbent telecom operator, and 2005, more than 80 less developed countries underwent some kind of privatization. 
Enormous system build-outs followed as surplus investment funds surged into telecommunications. Within countries where it had been prohibited or substantially restricted by the state, a major new outlet for transnational capital was secured. FDI, or foreign direct investment, flowing into the less developed countries uh, in telecom increased tenfold during the decade after 1990. Networks drew more investment in developing countries than any other industry. That's an important and interesting fact for a theory of digital capitalism. Foreign direct investment became uh, a major driver of system development. And this tendency persisted after 2000 uh, as greenfield projects replaced privatizations as the major growth sites. The internet, as it became popular, built on and further stimulated this mammoth network investment. A continuing cascade of new internet-enabled services and distribution channels has engendered unprecedentedly wide-ranging market destabilization. And so a couple of examples, voice over internet protocol, maybe everybody knows this uh, already, but I still find it interesting. In five years, Skype has become the world's largest supplier of cross-border voice communications. And uh, the traffic that's routed by Skype is projected to grow, uh, the figure is from the end of 2010, so it refers to 2010, it's projected to grow in 2010 by 45 billion minutes, which is more than twice the volume added by all the world's phone companies combined. That's market destabilization. Uh, think about the market shocks occurring around wireless as subscriptions approach four and a half billion around the world. So that mobiles, again, repeating what everybody knows, but perhaps casting it slightly differently, can begin to function as a strategic platform, a, a third screen, as it's so often called now, alongside the television and the computer. The mythology of creative destruction overshadows a more fundamental feature in all of this. The unleashing of a rampant impulse to commodification. Consider fee-based cultural commodities. Here, a small group of companies led by Apple, Amazon, Google, and Facebook has muscled in on long entrenched oligopolies over musical recording, books, games, and film. The interlopers have built new distribution systems around new and often proprietary platforms, iPhones, iPads, Kindles, Xboxes. As CD markets collapse, the handful of conglomerates whose music subsidiaries channel uh, the lion's share of global recording have had to cede profits to Apple. These conglomerates' film subsidiaries still control traditional movie distribution, but now they must contend not only with dwindling DVD sales and illegal file sharing, but also Netflix and Google's YouTube. These conglomerates' trade publishing subsidiaries dominate US trade book publishing, but this state industry is now witnessing especially vicious struggles. Traditional uh, publishers and bookstores must try to keep up not only with Walmart, which already had them reeling, but also with Amazon's killingly low retail prices and bullying tactics. Google's cutthroat strategy is predicated on the digitized plunder of millions of volumes tended on behalf of the public by academic libraries and librarians. Fee-based cultural commodities are recomposing as new products sold through new distribution channels as a new set of big owners emerges. A similar phenomenon is evident around advertiser-dependent services. Uh, and uh, I'll give as an example, uh, I'm going to cut a little bit here because I have a long way to go yet. Uh, Facebook. Facebook is hard at work rebuilding its hugely popular service around the sales function. Facebook noted the Financial Times just last year, quote, is desperate to attract brand advertisers, unquote. That was then. Although uncertainties remain as to whether deeply engaged users will break the magic spell 
in order to absorb advertisements. Marketers are stampeding onto Facebook. Comscore reported in January that, quote, social networking sites, which now account for more than one-third of all display ad impressions, were a significant driver of growth in the display ad market in 2010. So that's all good. Market news <laughs> fixes on these corporate struggles to master the commodity logic of a turbulent communications industry. The juggling of business models is intense as companies scurry to reorder and stabilize revenue sources, a trend aggravated by the slump. The churn of new product announcements and the endless effort to calculate how market changes may impact share prices crowd out all other considerations. Will Amazon's Kindle keep pace with Apple's iPad? No. Will an iPhone-enabled Verizon overpower AT&T? Yes. Is Facebook led by a nice man? <laughs> we may take better measure of this recomposition process by remembering that there are essentially three private options for launching and financing communications of every kind. Investment capital, <coughs> advertising, and direct fees, whether they be subscriptions, licenses, or rental charges. The rebuilding of the communication system around new technologies is overwhelmingly a story of how different enterprises and whole industries are casting about between these three models. Commodification, often re-commodification, is the common denominator. There are casualties. The travails of print journalism, which have been building for decades, are an instructive point of reference. Print ad revenue decreased by nearly half between 2000 and 2009, <coughs> while newspapers online revenue makes up for just a fraction of the shortfall. As online competition intensified, the downturn hit. Strategic planning then gave way to emergency measures. Journalists were laid off in droves. The overall investment in news gathering was radically cut, a grave threat has been posed to original reporting. During 2010, a few dozen full-time US foreign correspondents attempted <laughs> to cover all of China. I dare not even ask how many of them speak Mandarin. This is where we might remember that a fourth possible revenue model, government support, has been ubiquitously deployed throughout the crisis. <coughs> The U.S. has thrown trillions of dollars at banks, insurance companies, and automakers, and it will spend billions more to underwrite broadband service nationwide. Yet it has spent nothing to try to ensure the functioning of effective journalism. Why should it be a heresy to suggest that journalism merits public funding? The instinctive answer is government financial support threatens press freedom. One must always take seriously the threat posed by executive power to civil liberties. But whose freedom of expression is threatened by government support? The right of the public to access wide-ranging news and opinion? Or the right of media owners to pursue commodification as they may choose? Accountability will attach to federal funding. And accountability, in turn, will encroach on the sanctity of proprietary accumulation by media conglomerates. In the historical source and current center of digital capitalism, such a course is deemed unacceptable. As this discussion suggests, the commodity logic of a restructured communications industry ramifies far beyond the cut and thrust of clashing business strategies. There are also other ramifications. Notably, does the crisis signify that the dynamism of digital capitalism is now exhausted? Should I say that again? Does the crisis signify that the dynamism of digital capitalism is now exhausted? This is a very important question. David Harvey makes an essential point. Quote, crises are, as it were, the irrational rationalizers of an always unstable capitalism. We have always to ask, what is it that is being rationalized here, and what directions are the rationalizations taking, 
since these are what will define not only our manner of exit from the crisis, but the future character of capitalism. In this connection, it's crucial, though Harvey doesn't do so, to revisit the role of communications. As it took shape, digital capitalism gave a fresh impulse to accumulation, and during the 90s encouraged a fetishistic belief in information as a growth zone and a detoxifying agent. This enthusiasm, to be sure, did not resolve capitalism's crisis tendencies, as has now been amply, amply demonstrated. Yet, perhaps information and communications continue to harbor rejuvenating potential. May communications still act as a pole of growth in a reprise of its role a generation ago? Will the crisis develop or be managed in such a way that this growth potential is realized? In the US, uh, we've seen in the consumer media segment some uh, actual growth, e even into the most recent years that uh, they have collected data. So into 2009, which is the Department of Commerce's most recent data, the consumer media sector has actually shown some financial growth. Uh, measured in terms of uh, consumer media spending. Uh, and uh, so it went up from $740 in 2003 to $901 uh, in 2009. Uh, and at the bottom of the downturn, some of the big companies, uh, Cisco, for example, held a stash approximating $20 billion. Microsoft had $19 billion, Google $16 billion, Intel $10 billion, Apple I know we're always into rankings, 26 billion. Uh, these hordes, which have since gone sky high, have gotten much larger, afford a measure of liquidity that eludes capital based in less fortunate economic segments and geographic regions. Undoubtedly, some of these funds will go toward acquiring struggling competitors. Might the growth of these gigantic hordes, however, also signify a lack of profitable investment opportunities, even in the information sector? Blockages assuredly exist. But as I argued in digital capitalism, radical political economic change may yet transform activities historically provided mostly as social services into profitable commodities. This sector's prospective investment and profit potentials have not, I think, been fully tapped. It's a matter of, you may like that, you may dislike it, but it's my view uh, it's that way. One helpful indicator pertains to the continuing modernization of network systems. Capital expenditures on information processing equipment and software have been on an upward course for decades, growing impressively as a proportion of all non-residential fixed investment in equipment between 1970 and 1990. During the 1990s, IT investment increased by uh, what the, the official sources call a, quote, astounding, it's not a new term they usually use, you know, astounding in the Department of Commerce report. You don't <laughs> see that kind of language. Uh, astounding 18% a year before the internet bubble popped. At $296 billion, uh, according to the Census Bureau's 2008 Information, Communication, and Technology Survey, and that's the most recent year we have data for, capital investment in ICT, uh, including commercial software, accounted for about 36% of overall corporate spending on equipment, which is, that is a fundamental statistic. It means it's the largest single uh, item of corporate equipment spending. And it, it actually is worth saying, I've been uh, on email with uh, the statisticians at the um, Department of Commerce uh, Bureau of the Census because these statistics are incredibly uh, opaque. And it turns out that different agencies of the Department of Commerce are playing with different statistics, and the differences are on the order of $200 billion a year, which is a, a large amount. <laughs> so. Uh, I asked, and I'm using the more conservative statistics because I'm always on the conservative side. Uh, the crisis has not eliminated the need by all industry segments, from manufacturing to finance to communications, for continually modernized information infrastructure. 
And investment in ICTs remains an important driver of overall economic growth. And one, uh, parenthetically, that the administration is intent should become bigger if their own currently uh, released uh, economic report of the president just last Friday uh, is any guide. Communications infrastructure investment, the OECD tells us, quote, plays an increasingly important role in total investment within a country. And network investment in turn undergirds surging international internet traffic, 55% up in 2008, 60% up in 2009, uh, projected 56% in 2010. So all the way through the depths of the crisis, internet traffic has been growing incredibly. Uh, significantly ahead, actually, of the trend before the downturn. So again, we might use that as not of itself, but in conjunction with some of these other facts, uh, uh, an indicator. In a less exact but more encompassing sense, network systems and applications continue to permit powerful corporate and state actors to prepare great tracts of sociocultural practice, notably education, for private investment and to remake other sectors such as medicine and agricultural biotechnology and energy distribution and road transport around a comparable profit impulse. And so I mean, when you're talking about road transport or energy distribution, today you're talking about modernization significantly around ICTs, smart grids, for example, you know, or sensors embedded in roads. So this is not something that's at a remove from the thing I'm trying to isolate for you. In principle, therefore, I think fresh cycles of accumulation are feasible within this still expansionary growth zone. We must therefore look for signs within the crisis of efforts to hasten and secure these extensions of accumulation. How may this rationalization take shape? One thing is certain. It will be no mere mechanical exercise. International developments underline that communications are becoming an arena of intensifying struggle to reshape the world political economy. And this is my final section, and I'm going to come in on budget. <laughs> <laughs> this section is called the geopolitics of information. The collapse of Soviet socialism, China's embrace of capitalism, and the current acquiescence a concurrent acquiescence to U.S. originated neoliberal policies by elites throughout the LDCs has allowed the scale of capital search for profitable sites of surplus absorption to become planetary. The universal market discussed 40 years ago by Harry Braverman has been actualized. The dominance of US capital throughout this process is remarkable. The transnational supply of corporate routing equipment is led by Cisco. Search engines and online video by Google. Social networking by Facebook. <coughs> totemic smartphones and other appliances by Apple. Intel dominates semiconductors. Oracle business software Microsoft desktop operating systems. US-based companies not only uh, are the leaders in supply, and this is a point of significance to me, uh, but also in demand and use. From Walmart to General Electric, US corporations' integration of internet-based systems and applications set a global standard. If you're working at Walmart at any of their four or 5,000 stores around the world, you can get up-to-date figures on the sale of any item in any store by 4 a.m. of the next morning uh, through midnight of the previous day. That's an incredible strategic advantage for Walmart. But all it is is an example of the thing that companies in every side and sector of the demand area are trying to institute. US-based media systems and services have defined and occupied much of the newly transnational political economic space, quickly attaining a scale that beggars comparison. There are problems of measurement and of valid comparison, but consider that Skype's free internet phone service claimed 560 million users in the year to June 30th, 2010. Midway through 2010, Facebook drew 500 million. 
Microsoft, 789 million to its website. Yahoo, 633 million. Uh, there's a lot of unevenness. It requires a lot of elaboration. It depends on what the question you're asking about all this is. I'm just looking at the aggregate figures. Uh, but Facebook is visited by 92% of the internet population in Turkey, 87% in Indonesia, and 67% only in the United States. This goes far to explain how the company could be valued last month at 50 billion, and already this month they're saying it ought to be 60. You know, it's funny money. It's the same thing we had uh, before. A large proportion of global internet users, 944 million people, used Google services during June 2010. These numbers compare favorably with those garnered by the very largest global television networks. And in addition, web services gain a competitive advantage through their decisive advancement of audience measurement and tracking, data valence and stuff. US-based companies have built up transnational media platforms that aspiring rivals will find difficult to dislodge. US-based capital in the state have mounted an offensive to make sure it stays that way. But this is a struggle. New sites of economic dynamism and market strength have emerged. Geopolitical power is less concentrated than it was in the aftermath of the Soviet Union's collapse. There's fresh maneuvering room because the United States, already overextended, has been weakened, and how much weakened is not yet fully clear by the crisis. Disagreements are intensifying <coughs> over how the world political economy should be overhauled to resolve the present crisis. This lends a keen edge to the competition for mastery of the scarce sources of above average profitability, notably in communication. Developments in the People's Republic of China are of exceptional interest in this respect. Chinese leaders have succeeded in reserving their national market in communications for homegrown companies. Domestic suppliers and service providers from gaming site 4399 to CCTV, Shanghai Media Group, Alibaba, Kaishin, Shanda, China Mobile, Xinhua, Lenovo, Baidu are market leaders. It is symptomatic that the top four web portals, Sohu, Sina, Tencent, and NetEase, claim nearly three quarters of the sector's revenue in 29. US transnationals have been kept at arm's length. You all know as well as I do some of the major nodes of that Google's most prominent. The nature of this achievement should be specified. Chinese capital is not on a par with the US, European, and Japanese-based companies, which in many markets have already built up transnational production and distribution chains. Only exceptionally have Chinese extraterritorial groups, such as the network equipment vendor Huawei, become global leaders. Yet China's success in reserving its own national market in communications is remarkable in its own right. Not only does this constitute a pronounced exception to the post-World War II historical pattern <clears throat> in which national communications markets, even in such countries as Brazil and France, ultimately were dominated by TNCs. As well, it is occurring in the world's second largest economy, which continues to enjoy high growth even as stagnation and fiscal crisis persist throughout Europe, North America, and Japan and which may be poised to use economic policy to spur increased domestic consumption. So the Chinese National People's Congress is happening in early March. The current things I'm reading are saying that they are perhaps going to put a much higher premium on stimulating domestic consumption. This has been said before. Uh, it hasn't happened, so we'll see. But it looks like it might happen this time, and the implications of that are profound in a whole variety of ways, not least that they would stop financing the US deficit. Um, conflict over access to Chinese markets has therefore escalated because developments in the Chinese domestic market command outsized extraterritorial importance. On one side, we see a major executive branch initiative 
to reaffirm the long-standing US policy of free flow of information. This is happening in the Department of Commerce and the Department of State and some other places. China's sizzling communications market uh, is uh, promoting uh, continued growth of network systems and services, and that will only increase the allure. At latest count, there were no less than 450 million broadband users in China. That's a very large proportion of the global total. And nearly 600 million wireless subscribers. On the other side, China's leaders have uh, been showing really quite unusual boldness over the past few weeks uh, in expanding into transnational markets for new communications. So if you just watch the stuff that's been happening around Huawei the last two or three weeks, it's, it's very amazing. And they're basically putting the pressure directly on the US president to step up and allow market access. And they're talking freedom of investment. So why not you wait here? It's, it's a very interesting fight. Giuseppe de Lampedusa's formulation in his novel The Leopard famously captured the kind of dominative logic that still applies today. Quote, if we want things to stay as they are, things will have to change. Still, this is not a sufficient endpoint. Movement within the political economy encompasses more than a mechanistic capital logic, however much this logic may be revised to foreground digital sites of accumulation. We're living through a process of change whose character is both contingent and contested and whose outcomes will be determined by the balance of social forces within particular societies and across the world. In order for digital capitalism to be reconstituted, there will, as David Harvey concludes, quote, have to be wrenching and painful shifts in the geographical and sectoral locus of capitalist class power. The capitalist class cannot, if history is any guide, maintain its power without changing its character and moving accumulation on to a different trajectory and into new spaces such as East Asia. And I have tried to actually argue just that just now. Efforts will be made to impose additional concessions on already hard-pressed populations in low-growth regions such as the United States and Western Europe in living standards and in democratic liberties. Just so, today the offloading of debt from private financial institutions to government is being used as a basis for inflicting austerity budgets in Western Europe and the United States. As these exactions bite more deeply into social experience, there is every reason to forecast that popular opposition to capital's class project may intensify as indeed we are seeing in Wisconsin today. That communications and information remain a pole of growth in itself gives little cause for celebration. Digital bits do not break free of social pathways. And digital capitalism thus develops as its forebear did through episodes of crisis and boom. And as the people of Egypt have been reminding us, of opportunities for reconstruction along different lines. Thank you. <laughs> well, now I guess it's your turn and I get to eat. <laughs> no, actually, I would love to have some interaction. You were talking about the earlier about the amount of uh, investment uh, in you know, corporations. Yes. Period in ICT. Yes. Um, and, but we're constantly hearing about, or frequently hearing about, the, the extent to which the U.S. government <coughs> is primitive and backward yeah. in ICT, you know, unlike in Hollywood yeah. movies. Yeah. 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 You say, have an idea of why that is the case? Well, I, I mean, I think that's a very interesting question, and I think uh, it is uh, somewhat the case. Uh, for example, I mean, in the United States today, we are hearing constantly, and I'm sure you've had speakers come or other people here already have said, because they know, that the U.S. is, what, 14th in uh, broadband penetration, and countries that 20 years ago the United States sneered at 
uh, are outpacing the United States in, in broadband penetration as well as uh, in uh, other areas. So uh, in the consumer media sector, we can actually amplify the point. It's very interesting. Uh, in the games area, the U.S. doesn't lead in games. It's Korea and China. You know? uh, I mean, in terms of global market development in games, in, in wireless, uh, the same kind of thing could be said. Samsung is a huge force, you know, and Nokia is getting squeezed. Uh, so uh, there's no doubt that the, there is a greater, uh, let's say, intensity of competition over uh, the infrastructure. Going back to uh, the government's role, the, the government's role is to try uh, to provide uh, public funds to socialize, if you will, the costs of um, putting uh, the U.S. infrastructure in a more competitive position. What I would argue is that what's interesting about the present moment is that the U.S. Uh, lead, which had been unquestioned for decades, is no longer something that can be taken for granted. So uh, the question of, of where that lead might be uh, reconstructed, the extent to which it would be reconstructed, this is going to be a primary site of jostling. Um, but you see, it, it's a complicated question because um, the US market is still by far the largest single domestic market in the world. I mean, China is number two, but it's a quarter of the size of the United States. So decades out, if current trends are extrapolated, China will overtake the United States as the world's largest domestic market. Well, not even 10 years, maybe. But uh, for the moment, the US is the largest market. Well, businesses don't want to just let that sit around. They want to be able to extract profits. So we've got to get more here. But the long-term growth strategies of the big transnationals are all in the less developed countries. I mean, that's been a process that's been going for a long time. So I think we can expect to see um, a kind of interesting kind of discursive dimension of this around uh, who we are and whether we need to have this sort of investment uh, for purposes of national competition. And, uh, you know, I don't know. Actually, I was thinking of something different. That, that would be part of it. But the, I'm, I'm talking about the US government's own ICP apparatus. <laughs> I mean, after 9-11, you know, we've heard about it. We've heard about it since. You know, the, the FBI can't, you know, or, or various aspects of the government, or the, the White House has <coughs> primitive computer systems or whatever. You Absolutely. Know. And this has been true for 50 years. I mean, they have computer systems. I, I guess the way I would want to answer that is that the things that afflict the larger political economy don't stop short at the gates of government. So uh, for 50 years, the different government agencies were allowed to go and purchase computers from whomever they wanted. And the result was a melange of networks that couldn't interconnect. And the reason was it supported the whole US computer industry, not just IBM. So they, they gave money to everybody. But the result was they crippled their own functionality. Um, well, I mean, look at this statistic that I gave you from the Census Bureau. I had these long email exchanges. I couldn't penetrate the mysteries of these statistics. And it, it turns out that the Census Bureau was playing with statistics that they claim are right, but the, the um, Bureau of Economic Analysis of the same Department of Commerce, so this is in a way addressing the same kind of syndrome, uh, is happy to inflate the amount because in the internet bubble period, Greenspan and others at the top of the financial structure said they needed to find uh, some greater source of dynamism in the information area. So they just they made up $200 billion in annual expenditure. You know why? I mean, the specifics of it are interesting. In that inflated statistic, they include um, the, uh, the uh, uh, supposed amount that is spent by companies uh, producing in-house software for non-commercial use. So it's not to say that that wouldn't perhaps qualify, but you know, when you're talking about capital investment, you're talking about buying things that you, you know, you're investing in something. This is taking labor that's already employed in these companies and saying, well, we're going to count this, and I don't know what the actual dollar value per hour of that labor is that they use, to say that the capital investment is up. So anyway, I mean, it's a very uh, murky area, and I think that's emblematic of the thing you're uh, talking about. I would not impute any uh, overarching rationality to the government's um, impulse, uh, even though they are trying to throw a lot of money into this area. Other questions? Um, thanks uh, for your presentation and for cheering me up. <laughs> I was feeling kind of down, and now, you know, well, I always so have rosy. Um, to do that. Um, <laughs> um, I wanted to, um, as you might 
Guess I wanted to ask maybe about the kind of cultural production side of this of this landscape that you just laid out for us, um, um, and and I was thinking about you know the what you're talking about this kind of relentless commodification and and why should it be heresy to ask about public funding for journalism and and um, I've been working uh, in kind of cultural production areas cultural industries and. The same question. It seems like it's all, it's old-fashioned and and naive, kind of, for me to ask things like why, you know, why shouldn't we question public-private uh, partnerships, for example, for urban planning or yes. for, um, you know, artistic production. So, so that said, I'm I'm just wondering, you know, Harvey's you're pointing out Harvey's talking about the signs, you know, within the crisis. Yes. Where can we look in terms of cultural production for a retooling economic development um, that might lead to something uh, you know, that, that could challenge this you know, concentration of ownership over the cities, over, the, our, over artistic production, over culture itself? Oh, I, I, everywhere. I mean, that's the simple answer, everywhere. There's, there's, I'm not exactly a, a multitude kind of guy um, in terms of uh, you know, uh, that, that, uh, that approach, but I do think that there's something captured there because, um, well, uh, we're in a situation now that if anything that I'm saying is correct, uh, is going to become more intense rather than less and uh, more problematic. And as that occurs, who would have predicted a month ago that we'd have what's happening in Wisconsin? You know, who would have predicted uh, well, this is an interesting question. Two months ago, that what happened in Egypt would happen. Mm -hmm. Apparently, I read it in some back page of the New York Times a few weeks ago, the Obama administration seems to have understood it in August, but the CIA briefing in December said, oh no, it's all cool. <laughs> so, uh, I, don't know, I don't know what to believe about that. But, uh, so I mean, I, I think in a way that, uh, I'm, I'm quite hopeful. One of the Oscar nominees last night well, that didn't get it, uh, uh, I wasn't unhappy with which uh, film won the documentary award, but um, and it's kind of close to what I was talking about actually. But uh, uh, one of the runner-up was a uh, movie I was talking about last night. Uh, the uh, it's called Wasteland, and uh, if if you've had a chance to see that film, uh, it shows the um, uh, kind of oppositional impulse in garbage workers in the biggest dump in the world outside Rio de Janeiro and. You know, it's not a place that I would have imagined particularly oppositionality. You know, I mean, it's not, now it's on my landscape, but that's my point. You know, it, I don't think there's any um, one precinct or, or, or location that w one would want to uh, privilege, although having said that, I do think that uh, we tend to discount the significance of labor. Uh, and I think that even applies in Egypt where what's happened in Egypt is significantly related to the organization. Just think about the discipline of the people in Egypt, you know? I mean, the, 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 the killing all came from the other side. It didn't come from the hundreds of thousands of people. And that's a hard thing to have happen. I mean, you know, anywhere. That takes discipline. Where did the discipline come from? How did it happen? It was organized. I don't know how. I'm not an Egyptologist. I don't know anything about the history. But I know from what I read that labor was a factor in that labor laws. Um, I'm just curious uh, about two things. The first, in the beginning of your talk about uh, sort of the financialization and the mechanization of finance, um, I'm wondering if you see any alternative to that. Um, and I'm also, I also got a little bit confused when you started talking about accumulation mm -hmm. and what precisely you meant by that, and I was wondering if you could clarify sure. that. Sure. Okay, so could, you're, you're asking a very profound question when you say, uh, do I see any alternative to the mechanization of finance? As long as everything uh, is the way it is, no. But if there are fundamental changes, for example, uh, why not be provocative? If we uh, nationalized the banks, uh, which we did, sort of, uh, uh, then uh, maybe you could think about saying, well, there are certain changes that have to be. Uh, many of the products that have been the substance of the creative energies are things that should never have been created. 
in my view. I mean, they're, they're toxic. That's why we got what we got. They should never have been created. Uh, it doesn't take rocket science to know that. Uh, and it doesn't take rocket science to know it in advance. But, you know, it didn't matter. So I do perceive not only uh, the possibility of doing it differently, but the necessity of doing it differently if we're going to avoid another cycle of what we've just been going through. Uh, and in fact, I would commend to you, uh, because I know I can be sort of seen to be presenting uh, wild ravings, um, that uh, uh, you should look at uh, the book 13 Bankers. If you, have, if you know that book? So, you know, the guy was the previous, one of the previous top people at the IMF who wrote that book, Simon Johnson. And um, that's pretty much what he says. So um, that's the answer to the first question. Second question, what do I mean by accumulation? Uh, I mean uh, reinvestment of profits to produce more profits. Um, thanks so much for your talk. It was very, um, very interesting. And I wondered if I could get you to expand um, the bit that you said about education as one of the sites for recommodification and privatization. And yeah. Well, see, I, I wrote about education at length in the book Digital Capitalism, and so. Uh, it's an area that I've thought about over the years. Um, it gives me a heavy heart to talk about it because it's what we're in. And so, uh, and you, you feel it. I'm, I'm sure you feel a version of it here at USC. Where I am in Illinois, uh, the people in the humanities, literally, I mean, many faculty members in the humanities are publicly uh, demanding that there be a discussion of what is a university? What, what will this university be without the humanities? So that's an example of an area that doesn't carry its weight in market terms mm -hmm. in the current calculus. Um, is that OK? You know, uh, I, I'm not the one that's going to answer that question. But I do think that it is my job to pose it, or at least to help others you know, to contribute to pose it. Uh, there are many other areas, but I'm uh, going to the structural sources of it. I mean, if you let the public system uh, that we have basically created through tax revenues by ordinary people whose kids never went, uh, by and large, because it was a class stratified practice even then. Uh, but if we, if we let this public system deteriorate much further, a market opening will be uh, massively enlarged. And we're already seeing that being exploited by companies, um, you know, uh, you know them as well as I do. You ever drive through Phoenix? It's a worthy exercise to drive through Phoenix. Because uh, it's like one corporate university after another. It's not just the University of Phoenix. I mean, every exit has a new corporate university. And I think, oh gosh, there's a lot of diversity here in Phoenix. I can get all kinds of education. But, um, they're going to be moving. The University of Phoenix is the biggest university in the United States. It has, I don't know, 500,000 students, something like that. And it's easy to say, well, those aren't real students. You know, those students don't count somehow because they're working. Oh, yeah? So how many of our undergraduates aren't working? I'm they're lucky enough to have a job. You know, it's, so, so I think it's not going to be just because of uh, and annexing, but also because of a, a, a destruction of the existing system, or, or even just a, an erosion beyond where it currently is. Um, it, it's, uh, that's what I think is going on, and that's what, but I think one more point, and I'll shut up about it. Uh, education's a tradable service under the rules of the World Trade Organization, and there is absolutely no reason why we can't contemplate trading of that service uh, across national borders on a much, much enhanced scale. And that is, in fact, what I think is going to happen. It's a big problem. I mean, in China and in India, there's a huge private education business in those mm -hmm. countries. The question is, can they reach transnational scale? And there are some real barriers to uh, expansion. One of them is language, because at the moment still, even though you know, uh, an awful lot of people speak Mandarin, uh, 
there's only 45 million or so of them outside of China. So that's an issue. A second uh, issue is um, the, um, the brand. I mean, uh, they have a couple of very, very reputable brands in Chinese universities now. Um, Beijing University, Beida, uh, Fudan, uh, Tsinghua are all very, very uh, well-known brands, but still perhaps not on a par with Harvard or uh, Princeton or whatever. So, and the, the contradiction in a way is that Harvard and Princeton, I, I actually don't know the answer to this, but my guess is that they have not been quite as quick to transnationalize as they might be because they don't need to. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but if you compare Tsinghua with the University of Illinois, I'm not sure who wins. <laughs> you know? Just to follow up on that, I just, I'm actually writing an article on the branding of the university. And, oh, and, okay. um, and I was at UC Santa Cruz last week and was talking to them about the budget crisis of the UCs. And so just to just to add, you know, another layer to, to your answer about the University of Phoenix and the branded university, uh, my friends and colleagues at the UC said that they're really in the administration are feeling like they have no other choice but to adopt a particular kind of brand strategy and brand logic like the one that this university has and Harvard and Princeton and other private universities. So it's not it's not just this kind of discrete corporate university like University of Phoenix. It's right. a, it's a logic and a strategy that um, I think is you know undergirding you know education. Oh, you're quite right. And I but I I would suggest one cautionary note: higher education in the United States there are three thousand providers. What other big market has three thousand providers? Not very many. It's yeah. way way too unconcentrated. So, you know, this strategy is suicidal, but we don't know yet which will be the ones that do it. All right, on that cheery note. <laughs> <laughs> All right, listen, I hate to be the harbinger of doom, but uh, there's a lot of worthwhile stuff to do. It's a pleasure talking to you. Thank you.